Good afternoon. Welcome from the United Nations headquarters in Vienna, where we are sitting here at the Vienna International Center at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs meeting uh, with uh, three wonderful activists from Latin America, uh, Isabella from uh, Colombia, uh, Sara Snap from Mexico, and uh, Luciana from Brazil. And uh, today we will discuss new, the, what are the trends in drug policy reform in, uh, in Latin America. And uh, my first question to you is that uh, how much Latin America is highlighted at this meeting? Uh, do you see any, any, any chance that things will move uh, here? And, and what, what, can, what can your region expect from the United Nations? Well, I think the first thing is really start toward together. Uh, we have a lot of problems in common. And being together, thinking in solutions that works for all Latin America is something that really uh, help us to find new ways to resist um, to all the, the, the dangerous things that are in our horizon. Uh, for example, now in Brazil, we are trying to resist the, the perspective of leaving harm reduction behind and go to abstinence as an option, as a governmental option uh, to treat drugs issues. So uh, being together and try to understand how other countries are leading with this kind of thing help us to think in an organized way to, to be here and to try to make it, it an international discuss. Well, I think Latin America continues to play an important role here at the CND. Uh, Mexico has the chair of, is the chair of the CND this year. And so in one way, that's good because it allows us to be very close to the chair and to what's going on around the modalities uh, resolution and, and what's going to happen in 2019, which is kind of, we're in, in view of what will happen in 2019. But also what that means is that Mexico has to play a moderate position and they have to ensure that they don't come off as biased or pushing for anything uh, too, too progressive. And so they have to make sure that they reach a consensus. And so they can't necessarily be there saying, no, we need to make change, we need to make change. Um, and then I think, uh, so I think that there have been, we've maybe lost them as, as the strong, strong voice that they were, but I think it will be good for them to be moderating uh, the negotiations in some of these resolutions that are coming up uh, here in Vienna. On the other hand, there's certain countries that in years past have been more progressive. So in Guatemala, they, they, they used to have a discourse this, which was much more progressive, and what we heard uh, this morning was not quite in that same line. Um, I think Uruguay had a great presence today and they are moving forward with their reforms and they are talking about human rights being at the center and the cannabis regulation that's happening in Uruguay. So there's certain countries that are, that are speaking about these issues, but I think you know, we have elections coming up in the region. So in Mexico, we have elections. In Colombia, there will be elections. Uh, Costa Rica has elections. Uh, so, so we're going to see some shifts in, in the dynamics. And the Latin America of today is definitely not the Latin America of 2012 or 2015, where we saw more consensus in the region, but whereas now we see a lot more fractures in, in how the region moves forward. Yeah, just to echo what, what you both said, and complement the fact that not only Latin America is not as cohesive and as strong in terms of advocating for uh, reform in terms of drug policy, but that dispersion has led to also not condemn the horrific things that have happened ever since 2016. So I was, for example, surprised at the fact that the Philippines spoke today and there was uh, apparently no voice from the region to say that what is happening is not acceptable. And as for your second question about what do we expect from UNODC, I think that for Colombia at least, we need to have more vocal support, not only from UNODC, but from the whole international community to the peace process and the peace agreement. It's a very um, dangerous conjuncture right now with the elections coming up and some of the political forces that could be the potential winners of this election this year. Uh, those are political forces that want to 
uh, go away and go without the peace agreement, basically. So we need a strong voice from the international community, from uh, civil society abroad, from um, like-minded countries to support the peace process and support specifically uh, peace peace processes that align with the eradication of coca crops that are voluntary, that are aligned with development, that are aligned with human rights, and that are not based on repression and um, enforced eradication. So, so, so let's start with the peace process in Colombia. Can you explain to those viewers who, who are not very familiar with the situation in Colombia, like where, where this process started and how do you evaluate this process? in terms of like how it affects the, the people who are growing uh, coca in, in, in Colombia? Uh, so the process is now in its initial implementation stage. Uh, the peace agreement was signed in August of 2016, then it was held to a referendum, public referendum, and the no won by very small margins, but it won nonetheless. And this means that the, the process has very fragile legitimacy for the Colombian public. Nonetheless, the government has carried on with the implementation of the peace agreement. And what it means for coca growing regions is that some uh, voluntary programs have gone into those regions to make cocaleros um, like part of the regional economy. The main challenge of this is whether or not the government will fulfill its part. So far, cocaleros have actually eradicated their plants and have been um, very responsible in the fact of agreeing to be part of this voluntary process. And the government has not completed its part of building roads, uh, making sure that there are access to credits, access to land titling, which is a main component of how you can go into rural development. So it's a, it's a critical moment because the trust between the communities towards the states is very fragile. These are communities that have been sort of abandoned for 30, 40 years, even more. So now the government is saying, well, you just have to eradicate your plant and then we will come and, and make sure that a livelihood will happen. But when it doesn't happen, then what is left is that there are other criminal groups making pressure for people to continue growing coca. And this leaves them in a very dangerous situation into which they can be subject to violence from these groups or they can be subject to adhering themselves to the program but without a livelihood to support them. Um, and this again is why I go back to the, this big consensus on uh, supporting the peace process and supporting the fact that it's going to be a long process. It's not going to have results in the very short time. It's going to have results in the long term. And so we have to be patient with the fact that that's, that's the, the smart way to go. Just a little bit on, um, I mean, Isabella is definitely the expert on this, but there's, as she said, new criminal groups might be entering the market in Colombia, and I think that this is something that we need to be aware of and, and be concerned about. Uh, in Colombia, human rights defenders, and particularly human rights defenders of the of environmental human rights defenders, um, environmental rights defenders are having are, are being murdered at a very high rate because of their work. Uh, people who are signing up to the eradication programs are also in very vulnerable positions of losing their lives. And so this is one of the consequences that we've seen because I agree we need to support the peace process. The, the next government that comes into place will need to, to try and have continuation of these policies because it's the only way that in Colombia they're going to find peace. Um, but there is a, there's a huge issue around that if we don't deal with the issue at hand, which is cocaine, and that the majority of the coca that's cultivated in Colombia is destined to be, produ to be turned into cocaine and then exported uh, to the United States and Europe, uh, we have to address that issue. If we don't, we're, we're really ignoring the, the, the true market that, that is existing. And so I think you know, the rural development that's happening um, and the programs that are, that are being done to address uh, access to opportunities for those communities is highly important and needs to be continued. But at the end of the day, the government will at some point whether it's this government or the next government or the one after, we'll have to address what are we going to do around the issue of cocaine. And 
believing that voluntary eradication or even forced eradication is going to change something means that we are continuing a discourse of that these plants are no longer going to be on this planet, that people are no longer going to be consuming, and that's something that needs to shift because we know people are going to continue to consume substances, uh, and cocaine is one of the substances that's consumed in a primarily recreational fashion, uh, not in a problematic use around the world, and so we have to figure out how do we possibly create a, a market for regulated cocaine that is um, grown under fair trade criteria and where people are willing, people in the global north are willing to pay a higher price knowing that the product, um, the majority of that money is going to the producers rather than to the people who are trafficking and who often are, are undertaking violent activities in order to protect the product as it moves towards the, the market. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, yeah. I figured. And to, to add on that, yeah, I, I, I guess it's, it's still shocking to see a lot of hypocrisy around harm reduction because you see this very progressive country speaking about harm reduction and how they've improved the lives of people who use drugs, uh, respecting their human rights, which is all good and well, and we all continue to support that. But it completely ignores the fact that the drugs are coming from somewhere where people are being marginalized, stigmatized, criminalized, deprived of their human rights. So as long as those progressive countries did not um, broaden their spectrum of how they consider hu uh, harm reduction, what it is to be, and we open up the debate also beyond cannabis and also to other plants, to coca, to opium poppy, and say that these markets will not disappear. Uh, these markets have also a potential, if they are regulated, to be a source of livelihood for these communities from our countries, and just to not continue this hypocrisy of saying that harm reduction is only for, for drug people who use drugs. It's also for people who, who grow these plants. And it's a matter of social justice that we take into account both, both populations and not only those who are using drugs in the urban settings, but also those who are producing the plants of which the drugs come out of. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so actually, basically, you're saying that there is an elephant in the room, and that's the consumption of cocaine in, in like the let's say in, in, in like in the north part of the world like in Europe and, and America and then uh, that, that you need that, that we need a, like a kind of regulated market for growing and uh, distributing coca and trafficking it actually to uh, to the north uh, but still we see that even there is a there is a very strong opposition to cannabis legalization so do you think that there is like a real chance in, in the near future that there will be a regulated market for for cocaine products uh, how, how do you see the chance for that? I mean, so for the last two years, um, Acción Técnica Social in Colombia, who I collaborate with, and the Universidad Externado de Colombia have been working on a study, a prospective study, on what a regulated market for cocaine would look like in 2034. Understanding that this is not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to ha even happen next year or in the coming years, but that we really need to be future focused on what could be possible. And from that, we've identified specific variables that we need to be keeping an eye on and how those might change and how that might affect a possible market. But I do believe that, and we believe, that at some point politicians and someone who wants to put their will and their political capital behind this will look to the, to the, to the cannabis example and say, the market is different and the market will be structured differently, but that a regulation is the best way to repair some of the harms of prohibition. And, and that's having that social justice focus. And the Minister of Justice today in, in the side event spoke about that and he actually um, spoke about the cannabis market in Colombia becoming an economic opportunity for the country through, the, through exportation licenses which are included in their medical cannabis law. Um, and he, the last comment he made, you know, everyone else had spoken, and then the last, and he said, and you know, cocaine was used with medical purposes, and we should look into what that could be, those medical and scientific uses that are important that we might have to, you know, move towards. I mean, in our study, we're not, we're advocating for the legal regulation of a, a recreational or adult use, understanding that the majority of people, and we did a survey with cocaine, with people who use cocaine, who are using cocaine, um, use it less than 10 times a year, and they use, so that's not even on a monthly basis, um, and that they 
don't necessarily want to register with the government. They don't see their use as a medical use. They see their use as it's part of enjoying and pleasure. You know, we try not to ever in these wall in these halls speak about why do people use drugs? They use drugs because if they feel it feels good, you know, not always, but you know, they're leaving pain in some way or they're having a good time and that's something that that I think we try not to talk about. Um, and so so while I don't think that it's around the corner, cocaine regulation, I think that our job as civil society is to put the proposals on the table, to do the research, to become experts in these issues, so that when someday a politician turns around and says, we should think about this, then we have something ready. Because otherwise, this is going to take generations. And I think for Colombia, after 52 years of, of a conflict, they don't have time. Mexico, we don't have time. We cannot keep at the same pace that we've been doing. It's just too much on our communities. And every day we think, oh, maybe this is the tipping point. Maybe this is too much. You know, Ayotzinapa, maybe that's, but it, it doesn't, it's hard to know when we're at this breaking point. And when you ask analysts, you know, in the example of Mexico, where are we in the scope of w war in the country? They say we're not even halfway there. And that's really, really scary. And I think that the other piece of the coca cocaine debate is around smokable cocaines in Latin America and the need to get harm reduction services to folks who are consuming in those spaces and what are also the circumstances around their consumption of that of those drugs, not necessarily just their consumption, but rather what are the opportunities they need. And Brazil is one of the examples where that's really showing up um, and where they had great programs, but now they're being taken away. Setting you up. <laughs> Yeah, actually, there is something that I think that put all the countries together in Latin America. That's the violence and how people who is living uh, for s products or sale drugs, uh, people are dying. In Brazil, nowadays, we have more than 60,000 people who is dying every year. And we, we really can't stand on this line. We, we need to change the things. And we need to do this right now. It, we can't stand like this. People are in jail, people are being killed, and it won't change the, the fact that people are using drugs because they feel like. Uh, so it's something that we, lean, we, lean, we really need to be together to try to change all the violence that is involved with the drug use. Uh, not the drug use, but how the government leads with the drug use. Uh, there is something that I really think it's important for all the countries too. It's how the judicial system is treating these issues. Uh, for example, how can the judiciary or other, judiciary or other institutions that are law institutions is continuous to put people in jail for crimes, drug crimes, is continuous to be okay with so many people dying. Uh, how can we continue to do like this? And we know who is dying in Brazil, uh, who, is, who is in the jail, who is, in, who is dying, is our black and poor people. We, we all know this. 70% uh, of our women in jail are there because of drug crimes, so we cannot continue like this. Uh, we really need to change how the things are going, and the responsibility needs to be divided, not, on, not just on the government, but also with the judicial sisters, in my point of view. So w what's new in Brazil in terms of the uh, drug, drug war, uh, especially with you know, police and favelas? Uh, and what's the position of the government now? Do, do, do they want any reform or are they open for any, any reform? No, we don't have good perspectives. Nowadays, actually, we have a military intervention in Rio de Janeiro that makes things even more difficult. Uh, our government put a military uh, chief uh, in front of our security policies and people are completely afraid of what does it means in a, in a f when we look f we also have elections in October and we are seeing this as a political 
option to to obtain more sustainable sustainability for the the program but it's so dangerous that we are doing this again in brazil we have the military assuming the responsibility that is civil and we have a lot of army in the streets in favelas actually it starts with rio de janeiro but nowadays we are looking forward and seeing is it going to be our reality in many states we still don't know but we think it's there is a chance that it happens and we are all worried about it we don't see a good perspective in a short period what about mexico do you see the light in the end of the tunnel the terrible drug war yesterday we had a session where we had a we had a great activist speak maricela who was speaking about how losing uh, her sons in the war on drugs and and that's how dangerous the life of human rights defenders in mexico so so so, so do you see any hope it's very hard to see hope because um we had militarized our public security in 2006 and that's where we saw this increase in people being killed and people being disappeared and people being displaced um, and what happened this last December was that essentially the government had been operating under a state of ex exception in, in allowing that militarization to take place and in December we passed a law which formalizes and legalizes that militarization and so and with the elections coming up, we, f we also see that as possibly being used as a way to intervene uh, or repress s social protests that might happen around the election. Uh, so we have a lot of concerns around this interior internal security law, which is what it's called, um, and how that might impact human rights defenders and the situation on the ground, um, and, and how that intersects with the, the war on drugs um, and so I think I think that's what we're seeing um, in Mexico is the, is the need to really I see the light at the end of the tunnel as movement building that's really where we're going to see a change and where it, if we are able to show the intersectionality of how the drug war issue with the human rights is completely issues are completely connected with um, environmental defenders um, with access to, to essential medicines. So all of these issues, feminist organizations, you know, how do we really bring together all of these groups, people, who, family members of people who've been disappeared, how do we bring together these groups so that we can create pressure from below to the, to the political level? Because what we saw is we had this medical cannabis law that was passed uh, also in December, and what really was passed was the capacity to import CBD products um, from foreign pharmaceutical companies. And so that's not going to provide any sort of economic uh, stability to people who are currently cultivating cannabis in Mexico. Um, it doesn't face the reality of that we are a country that cultivates cannabis and has for, for centuries. Um, and instead, it's, it's, it's what the government and legislators, it was the minimum that they had to do to appease the media that we had, you know, rallied around the case of a young girl who has epilepsy, Grace Elizalde, and so, and and because of the Supreme Court case that gave the right to cultivate to four individuals in 2015, uh, based on the constitutional right of the free development of personality. So we had these moments, these historical moments that were very important in drug policy, and I think we were hoping that we would get a little bit further with Ungas. And now that it has, it has um, calmed down, it's hard to see where to go next. I mean, proposals, there are many proposals. Why are we not legalizing the poppy crops that we ha currently have in order to make morphine, which is something that is not readily accessible to the, to the population as a pilot project, as a, as a means of, of helping create livelihoods for those uh, rural campesinos in the state of Guerrero, which is the poorest state in the country, um, th that we should regulate the cannabis market because all of the west coast of the United States has regulated and Canada is going to regulate and we'll be the only ones in North America that haven't regulated cannabis. Um, so, so we have these reasons, we have these things that we should be doing. We should have a supervised consumption site in the north of the country for people who are injecting drugs. Um, 
but it's hard because there's the, the government is not going to take any steps as long as we're in an election period. And so essentially we are um, right now trying to be close to the candidates and see whether any of them would take on some of these proposals. But it's already a very divided issue, and so it's hard to see how they might really take that on. And so that's where I, I see the most hope in how do we work together across movements? How do we build something that, that allows us to, to understand that um, our issues are common and that we need to be working on them together? A few weeks ago, there was a sacred plants conference in Ajijic, Mexico. And that was also interesting because there were lots of shamans and indigenous groups that came. And that's an issue that we need to be working closely with. And we don't see it that much in these spaces. Um, but with drug policy reformers and them, I mean, we, I, I don't need to be an expert in peyote to be able to advocate for their rights and to be able to advocate for, you know, uh, expanded access to the plant and conservation of the plant. Um, but then vice versa, they, they can also take on our issues around well, or the ones I represent around, you know, people are using drugs on a recreational basis, and so how do we regulate those markets? How do we get harm reduction services to people who need them? How do we get education to people who, who, who need it? So it's really about how do we share issues, and how do we see this within a social justice framework, all of it? Because at the end of the day, uh, and I think California's legislation is the one that best embodies this, um, regulation, the regulation of markets really needs to be within the social justice perspective so that we can begin to reverse some of the harms that have been caused by prohibition. In, in the end of our discussion, al allow me a personal question, because I think it's very, sometimes it's very depressing to, to work in this field. You hear so many uh, sad stories about, you know, loss of lives and, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, human rights defenders are in danger. Uh, just just because they are doing their work. So wh what is it what keeps you motivated and, and keeps you, you know, still working in this field, like f still fighting for, for human rights? Where, where do you get, get your stre strengths from? I think it's precisely there with the people and their families and how can we work to try to stop all these horrible things that are our day by day in our countries. I think that's it. Yeah, I would agree with Luciana. I mean, it's that it's knowing people who've been so impacted or being part of communities that have been impacted. And this is, I mean, we're all living a trauma for many of those in Latin America of just the security situation or the insecurity situation and, and recognizing that the way that the countries are moving is not the correct way. We're, we're, we're warmongering instead of building peace because it's much harder to make peace. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's, it's the people. And it's also just knowing that, that we're on the right side of history. And this might take generations, but we're just going to keep at it and we have to keep going. And because and it's just rationally, pragmatically, on a justice level, it is the correct thing to be doing. And so this can all go on and this is a simulation of, of something and it's really important that we're all here. But to have the community that we build both in these places on an international level and then also on a national and local level, that's what gives me energy is knowing that there's so many smart people who are just really passionate about this issue and that's how I feel and I just wanna keep uh, putting proposals on the table, really thinking about the future and making sure that together we are coming up with with solutions rather than just saying this isn't working but rather no this is how it could work i think that also additional to what you've said because the strength comes from seeing the resilience and resistance from the people who are enduring the, mo the most harms but also acknowledging this the place of privilege from where we all stand we are all here in a place of a lot of privilege and the only way to serve that privilege justly is to name the harms that have been caused in the name of the war on drugs. And those are mostly not harms to me personally. To my country they are, but, but mostly to people growing in rural regions, for people, women who have been incarcerated for very, very minor offenses who are just trying to provide for their families. Those are not harms to me personally, but I, am the, I have the privilege to be here and speak on behalf of those. I definitely feel privileged to have this very interesting uh, discussion with you. Thank you very much for accepting our invitations and thank you for those who 
Wo war ich das schon? 